Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to our in-depth discussion of ancient Rome, right? We are starting, of course, my favorite thing to teach, as I've already said this about 800 different times, and we did a very, very good job today in class discussing the fall of the kingdom period of Rome, the beginning of the, M or excuse me, the republic period of Rome, and we did a big thing today introducing the concept of a dictatorship in Rome, right? We talked about Cincinnatus and his battles against the Akai, right? And we talked about how Cincinnatus emblicize the idea of a man coming to power during a time of war and then returning the fascists to the people of Rome in times of peace, right? So that is very, very important that we understand that, that this dictator role is going to become very important in Roman culture, especially in their early, fledg early fledgling republic. Well, not even really fledgling. It was actually about 200 years in that they really established, about like 100 and something years in, they established the idea of the dictatorship. But the big thing about it, though, is, is that Cincinnati beats the Akai, gives the fascists back to the people of Rome, gives control back to the Roman Republic, and returned to farming. And he became a hero, emblicized in Rome forever. So the big thing about that going forward is, we cannot dawdle, because i got to keep this under 15 minutes. So going into it, though, okay, obviously, as you can tell, there's a lot of different things all focusing around war in ancient Rome, right? War in ancient Rome is going to become a very, very important characteristic of their society, and a big thing about it is, is that early on, they weren't the best at it, right? So something that you need to understand about ancient Rome, right? In ancient Rome, at the very beginning of their civilization, from 759 when Romulus stabs Remus, all the way up until about, give or take, about 300 BC, so over about 450 years, the Roman army not the most organized thing on the planet, right? It was actually like a very, very simple hoplite style army that a Greek would have had, but even more loosely used than the Greeks did, right? When the phalanx system was improved by Philip II of Macedonia, the father of Alexander, and they go out and take over all of Southern Greece, they're using the phalanx system in a very efficient way. Early on in the Roman history, they used it just kind of carelessly and frivolously, right? They had hoplites just like Greeks did. They had men wearing armor and stuff like that just like Greeks did. They had guys that were wearing, like, carrying with them iron swords and weaponry, just like the Greeks did, right? But something crazy is going to happen to them in 390 BC, right? In 390 BC, this group of people known as the Gauls are going to invade and sack Rome for forever, right? Well, not for forever. They're going to sack Rome, right? And so the Gauls, who they are, they are these barbarians that live to the north, right? And they actually don't even really look much like this. But this is right here is what would typically be seen as a barbarian or like actually this is what you could consider a Gallic warrior during the winter time, right? Except some Gauls, as we know from like looking at history, there's actually Roman reports that some Gauls actually might have fought in the nude, so he wouldn't be wearing like something like that. But the Gauls were another group of people that lived to the north of Rome. There's also several different types of Gauls. There's Alpine Gauls. There's uh, like Southern Gauls. There's all these other different ones as well. But the big thing you need to understand is that early on in Rome's history, in about 390 BC, they had their republic system. They are being led by two consuls. They are no longer being led by kings anymore. The Romans are going to get really, really arrogant, right? Like, so the Romans got extremely arrogant, and they thought, oh, nobody can beat Rome. Every time somebody attacks us and fights us, we end up beating them anyway. Oh, my God, look how arrogant they are. They basically turned into the, high, the personality of a high school boy, right? Well, what happened was, at this one battle called the Battle of Elia, which is actually at the very, very small river to the north of Rome, a group of Roman soldiers beat a small contingent of Gallic soldiers, right? A small group of Gaul soldiers were there. The Romans roll up on them. They defeat them in a small battle. They kill everyone except for a handful of them, and they send a couple of them away, and they're like, go tell your leader that the Romans are here and that we can't be beat, right? They run off and tell the leader of the Gauls, a man by the name of Brennus, who is a very, very large individual, who has a very, very intense mustache and beard combo, Brennus, king of the Gauls. All right, so yeah, who is a very intense figure, and you can actually see him right, come on. All right, so yeah, come on, internet. There he is. You can see him right here in this massive bust and stuff like that, that he, as a leader of the Gauls, is not here to mess around. His soldiers come up and tell him, he's like, sir, sir, these Romans came and beat us up and stuff like that, and they said that they were never going to be beaten in battle. Brennus then assembles a massive contingent of Gauls to march on the early city of Rome and teaches them a lesson that they will never forget. Listen to me very carefully. Brennus teaches the Romans a lesson that they will never forget. Because Brennus and the Gauls walked up on Rome and sacked Rome, right? So something you need to understand in this little explanation is what the word sacked means, right? Sacked means to destroy, burn, and pillage, right? So the big thing that ends up happening is the Gauls march on the city of Rome, and there is basically no resistance. Because the Romans realized they have stepped in something that they shouldn't have stepped in, right? And what had happened was, is that the Gauls rolled up, 
destroyed the city to almost no one stopping them because most of the Romans had ran away. So the Romans bit off a little more than they could chew, right? They threatened the Gauls, the Gauls showed up, and almost all of the Romans had ran away to a different city to try and seek cover when the Gauls were coming because they heard of them marching on Rome, right? This right here is actually the outside of an old casket that shows the like, Gauls actually marching on the city of Rome and killing people and severing heads and murdering horses and all this other stuff. But the big thing about it, though, in general is that when the Gauls showed up, they were killing elderly people in Rome that couldn't, that weren't strong enough to run away. They easily walked up and over the wall that was outside of Rome that didn't even really have good fortifications. It was basically just a muddy hill with sticks on it, right? And they walked up to the bottom of Palatine Hill, that all-important hill that Romulus started the city of Rome on top of, and sitting at the base of it, the Gauls looked up on top of the hill, and they could see that there were some Roman senators and some Roman leaders that were hiding up there, right? And so the Gauls spit several weeks pillaging, burning, and destroying Rome, and actually themselves dying in large numbers because they were getting malaria and they were starving and stuff like that. But the Gauls would like burn their dead at the base of Palatine Hill, looking at the Romans that were hiding up there being like, soon enough, that's going to be you, right? And one night came in the Gallic sacking of Rome when the Gauls decided to try and sneak up on the Romans. They were at burlap around their feet. They snuck up there in the middle of the night, like early, early hours of the morning. They snuck past Roman guard dogs and were pulling their swords ready to stab these Roman senators and leaders to death. And then all of a sudden, a goose that protected this one temple in particular, like like this like sacred goose that lived in just starts going honk, 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 and warns everybody. The Romans wake up and they plead with the Gauls. They look at Brennus and his soldiers and they're like, please, sir, please leave us alive. We'll do whatever you want. And Brennus holds the city of Rome ransom for a thousand pounds of gold, right? And every time his soldiers would walk by the scales, they'd add a little bit more weight onto it. And literally, Brennus took out his sword and sat it on the weight side and dropped it, as you can see right here, on the heavy-weighted side and said, woe be to the fallen, right? And so basically, the Gauls smacked cocky Rome in the mouth and said that y'all need to get your stuff together, right? So the Romans were embarrassed by this. In 390 BC, when the Gauls invaded and sacked Rome, the Romans were embarrassed because they had lost to people like this, right? They lost to people that they believed were fundamentally unorganized and fundamentally, like, literally heathens by the comparison of Romans to the other people of, like, it, like of Italy, right? And so the Romans decide that it is time for us to organize our army, right? So following being sacked by the Gauls in 390 BC, the Romans decide to go off and sufficiently organize their army and create new units and make a better army and better fortifications. You can actually go and see one of the walls that are actually there. It's called the Servian Wall. Servian Wall. This piece of this wall is actually sitting next to the Roman train station at the Termini Station in Rome, and you can actually walk up and see it. And that that is the wall that they built after the Gauls sacked Rome because they were like, no more of this muddy hill, stick garbage. Let's make an actual legitimate wall that will be able to keep the Gauls and other barbarians out of the city of Rome, right? So the big thing about it as well that ends up going down is they organize their army into a system known as legions, right? So they decide to take their military and split it up into chunks. And they split it up into each individual legion, right? So when you looked at the Roman military before its organization, it was thousands and thousands and thousands of hoplites being loosely led by generals and officers and leaders of Rome. And so they decided to be like, all right, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take four to 6,000 of you individually, and we're going to put you into what's called a legion. And there would be a general or an officer set appointed to lead each legion. And this would define the Romans later on because they would be able to efficiently do this thing known as dividing and conquering, right? They would be able to take their legion and cut it up into smaller pieces and then send it out to different areas of Italy to efficiently conquer and take over. They also, though, while they're conquering and taking over people after they organize their military, they're going to allow those people to keep their customs, keep their religion. All they had to do was pledge allegiance to Rome, pay their taxes, and they're even going to extend citizenship to a bunch of them, right? This is a very big theme of Roman society early on, okay? Early on. I'm going to say that again. Roman society early on, right? So, like, big thing about it, though, is also, as they took over these different areas, they are going to, like, extend citizenship to them. They're going to allow them to vote in Roman elections. They're going to allow them to be a part of, like, the Roman society. And then also going forward as well, jot this down, 
by 200 BC, the entire Italian peninsula is taken over by the Romans, right? So like this very efficient military might have never come around though, had the Gauls not destroyed them and showed them that you shouldn't be so cocky, Rome, that you need to kind of humble yourself a little bit, right? And not only is their military gonna be super organized, but it's also gonna be phenomenally, technologically very efficient. The Romans show up with all these new weapons and stuff like that and commit themselves to war and designing new war, like actual equipment that is gonna make them so good at taking over different areas, right? For example, this right here is gonna be actually built during the Roman military period, during the empire and late Republic period, a thing known as a catapult using use being used to siege and destroy enemy cities crossbows would be used these little guys which are super diabolical that would be spread out all over a field and then they would coax barbarians to actually run over them and charge at them and barbarians would step on them and like skewer their feet also this is a big thing as well roman caligas is a very very important image going forward these are the roman military shoes that they would all wear and they had metal studs on the bottom of them that made it efficient for them to walk it also made them an effective tool to use as a weapon to kick somebody in the face should you actually need to right and the biggest thing about the roman military is the thunder that you heard whenever the Romans would build roads over the areas of which they conquered, right? So every time the Romans would take something over, there's a last little couple slides I skipped over, you don't need to worry about them too much. When the Romans would actually take over a place, they would build a road that went from the place they took over and went all the way back to the city of Rome, right? You need to write this quote down. It is so phenomenally important. You better remember it. You'll never forget it for as long as I have you as a student because it's just that important. Jot this down all roads lead to Rome, right? All roads lead to Rome. All day long, all roads lead to Rome, right? Where do all roads go? Good job, Caitlin Sturmont. Wait, how many roads does, do the Romans have? Good job, Ruther. All of them, right? All roads lead to Rome all day long, all right? So the big thing about it, though, is what's going to happen is the Romans are going to build roads to connect the empire and share the fruits of their conquering with all these new citizens. And these roads are not going to be garbage roads. They're going to be sufficiently created and efficient roads, right? Well, not all of them. Some of them were like dirt paths and stuff like that. But the ones that they dedicate themselves to, like the very first one known as the Appian Way, right? The Appian Way that cuts through the Apennine Mountains to make it so you can easily traverse the entirety of the Italian peninsula, they would have a sophisticated system of building them and they would lay a layer of sand and then stone slabs crush stone and then would put stone blocks on top of them now how does this relate to those crazy shoes that the romans would wear whenever they were marching on cities they would have metal studs on the bottom of their feet and they would be marching along these stone roads and people that lived far away said it sounded like the roman military was an oncoming storm right just a cloud 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 the marching in unison of the roman military and the efficient building of these roads is just going to horrify the people that they're going to come up against right now roman history in general we're now getting into the chronology of roman history is divided into like three specific time periods right you got the kingdom period the Republic period, and the Empire period. Now, have we been jumping around this thing a lot, right? Yes, we have, okay? You don't need to write this little thing down right here. This is the essential part you need if you don't already have it. But the Kingdom period is all that period where Rome is just establishing itself. The Republic period is now their rule by the people, where the fascist is used to actually symbolize their ruling power, and we use elements of the Roman Republic in our government today, which is why the fascist is on the back wall of the rotunda in the Senate building, right? And the Empire period is the big one that we'll get to a little bit later on. Now, when we've been talking about all this stuff, we've been mainly jumping around in the Kingdom period, and the Republic period, right? But what we're about to do is we're gonna set our feet really hard into the Republic period now and start moving forward with Roman history from that point. Because we talked about Romulus stabbing Remus, which happened in the Kingdom period. We talked about the very first roads being built just now, which happened actually in the 319s of the Republic period. We talked about the Cincinnati dictatorship, which only happened a mere 50 years into the Republic. And we talked about the Gauls sacking Rome, which actually happened in 390 BC, not 309 BC, which also occurred during the Republic period as well. Now, the big thing that we're now moving into, though, is what the Roman Republic is and why it's so important, okay? Now, what you need to understand, and the last thing that you're going to need to write down for this flip, is the following thing I'm about to show you. One set of four letters forever symbolize the Roman Republic and let people know the greatness that was the rule by the people stature of Rome. And it was this thing known as S-P-Q-R. It is such an important four set of letters that literally to this day in the modern Roman city, in the modern city of Rome in Italy, they have it on their manhole covers even to this day, right? I took this picture while I was in Rome, right? And what it stands for is Senatus Populus Romanum. 
which stands for the Roman Senate and People, right? And it all radiated out of a very special location. But we'll talk about that when I see y'all in class. Y'all have a good one.